Welcome to the stories behind the songs with Dave Kittle. Back in 1979, Dave began a radio career at Shea 106 in Ottawa, which spanned 17 years. He was one of the on-air voices that I grew up listening to, and he introduced me to new music that literally changed my life. His knowledge and passion for music are inspiring, to say the least. And in this six-part podcast, Dave and I sit down and discuss the British invasion. They could never finish a show. Like the Beatles, Beatles would play twenty minutes uh, before they before they they w- were ushered off stage because the, just the, the the adulation of the fans, right? Uh, the screaming and um, the Stones attracted a much rougher audience. The Stones were a much more male oriented band, right? Okay, yeah. The guys liked them a lot more than girls did. They they had a much much larger male audience because they kind of came off as gruff and they were they were they were a little bit rougher. They rougher, were much yeah. more blues influenced than the Beatles ever were. Right, um, right. So they were and they were a much tougher looking and sounding band than the Beatles were. And so yeah. they they attracted uh, a lot more guys, which was a lot more violent. So a lot of their a lot of their early shows. They never even finished the show. They would, after a couple of songs, they would have to like flee the stage because the audience was just out of control. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Times have changed. Although I'm sure there's still some some bars maybe along in the U.S. somewhere where they're used to got you know chicken wire up because people like to throw beer bottles. Maybe you know, maybe in the southern United States. Yeah, I don't know how many of those places still exist, but yeah, I, I, I could well imagine what it would have been like to have been at a Rolling Stone show in 1965 in the U.K. <sighs> It would have been something else. Yeah. Absolutely something else. Just in all the intense screaming and the, the kids trying to get on the stage yeah. and just, you know, totally out of control. And the band having to, to run for their lives, you know, they just <laughs> basically grab their guitar, unplug their guitar and, 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 and run for their lives, basically. Say you take Justin Bieber today or, or when he was really, really, really yeah. something in, you know, uh, He'd have screaming girls, screaming fans, yeah. but but he also had bodyguards and yeah. probably never experienced that kind of a, a probably thing. Probably not. Security, yeah. security would have been much better. Yeah. Uh, during say somebody like Justin Bieber in his in his peak period, yeah. what ten, fifteen years ago when when he Has was it been that long already. Yeah. Oh my God. But yeah, he would have had uh, the security would have been much better. Don't don't forget, you know, in the Rolling Stone show in nineteen sixty five. They were playing probably in a theater with a with a with a four foot stage and an audience and no bodyguards on stage, right. nobody on stage, it's just no them in the audience. Just, that's it. Th- that was it. Crowd, yeah. That was it. And their 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 road manager, and they didn't even have roadies back then. Their road manager, Ian Stewart, was responsible for setting up their equipment. So he would set up their equipment. He would drive them to the gig. Set up their their crude stage setup of a set of drums and amplifiers and yeah. microphones, and then the Stones would come on, and that would be it. And Ian Stewart would be standing at the side of the stage trying to fend off all these girls who were trying to get at Mick Jagger on stage. And yeah. if you look at some of the footage of of those shows back in those days, it was it was insane. All this one guy doing all that, pretty much, same as the Beatles. Beatles traveled with uh, with a two man road crew, two. throughout their entire touring career. <clears throat> they had a two man road crew. They had a, a a road manager named Neil Aspinalli, who had was with them from the very very early days. Okay, um, and drove them to gigs back when they were nothing, and eventually became their road manager slash uh, well yeah their road manager. Okay. And then they had a guy named Mal Evans, who was a former bouncer at the Cavern Club, that they took on when they started getting a little bit bigger, and he looked after their equipment. Wow! But they traveled with two people throughout their right up until they ended touring in in the summer of 1966. They just kept it simple. It's just a, that was it. The they, basic necessities. They, they, they had two people. Oh, you know, they yeah. had two people, yeah. basically with them. Now, I got to ask you this. There's this thing out, you know, that exists in the world that says if uh, you're either the Beatles or you're Elvis. You, you, you like one, you don't like the other so much. 
do you agree with that? Disagree? Would you say you're more Beatles than Elvis? Well, I would say more Beatles Stones. Uh, Elvis, okay. it, don't forget, uh, Norm. By the time the Beatles hit, Elvis's career was pretty well done. Um, Elvis really, when you look back on it, mm -hmm. had a pretty much a two-year yeah. reign at the top. But but he also made quite an impact. Oh, he Let's, certainly did. You know, he, yeah. Elvis was the first. Yeah, uh, Elvis was the first real rock star because he was so damn good looking, and he was so different. Don't forget, there were other people around. There was Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry. These guys were all yeah. contemporaries of Elvis. Yeah, but they didn't look like Elvis, and they weren't marketed like Elvis was. Correct. Yeah, that's right. So Elvis really had a two to three year reign at the top. And he was the he was the, he was it. I mean, he had numerous number one records and numerous sold out concert tours, etc. But yeah. he went into the army at the peak of his career. That's right. That's true. He did. And yes. Did, and do, did yeah. two years in the army. Yeah. Now he recorded a bunch of stuff before he went into the army. His manager, Colonel Tom Parker, knew was a very smart guy. So he had Elvis record a bunch of stuff that they released while he was in the army over in. Europe. He was stationed in Germany. Right. <clears throat> but when Elvis came out of the army in 1960, he went to California and started making movies. Right. He had made a. He had made I think one movie or two movies before he went into the army. But when he got out of the army in 1960, he went to California and started making movies. And he made movies, a lot of bad movies, throughout the, <laughs> throughout the 1960s. Yeah. So his recording career, by and large was non-existent during the 1960s. It wasn't until uh, 1968 when he had his big uh, comeback TV special okay. that Elvis, people started paying attention to Elvis again. Right. He made a lot of bad movies, released a lot of bad songs that were written specifically for these movies. Okay. Now, his yeah. soundtracks still sold very well, mm -hmm. but... From a cultural standpoint and a chart standpoint, yeah, yeah. right through the 1960s, Elvis was was a non-event. Wow, he really was. And so, by the time the Brits came in, he was he was he, he was pushed aside. You well, would say, well, well, and he wasn't pushed aside. He did it of his own volition, largely through his manager, Colonel Tom Parker. Elvis always wanted to be an actor. Elvis wanted to be a movie star. He was and, a he was a truck driver, right? He was, was a he truck not? driver for a while back I mean, in, that's his, in, in, before in he Memphis. Be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was working driving a truck right. when he, when the legendary story is he walked into Sun Studios in Memphis to make a recording for his mother's birthday, and that's where Sam Phillips first discovered him, and first started to record him, because huh. Elvis or uh, Sam Phillips always said that if he could find a white man who sounded like a black man. He could make a fortune, and he did. In Elvis. He, yeah. In Elvis. Um, but Elvis was driving a truck yeah. in Memphis when he, where he lived at the time. Yeah. But but Elvis really, throughout the, the whole 1960s, the most uh, creative period and the most things changed the most in popular music. Elvis was a non-event. Same as same as guys like Chuck Berry, yeah. Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis. All through the the nineteen sixties, these guys really were forgotten. Wow, were really forgotten um, because it was the, the, everything was everything was taken over by the, the the new bands like the Beatles and the Stones, and yeah. and it wasn't until later on when that people started to rediscover these artists. But uh, I would say a, a better comparison would be: Were you a Beatles fan or were you a Stones fan? I'm sure that exists as well. But oh, very much so, much yeah. way much way much more than the Beatles and Elvis. Okay, because right. again, again, by the time the Beatles hit, um, most of Elvis's fans base were had moved on. Yeah, they weren't they weren't paying the, they weren't into the Beatles and the Stones. Yeah, they had moved on to other people. Okay, when when Elvis made his, you talk about a TV special when he came back and mm -hmm. was that the new and improved, bigger and better Elvis? No, this was prior to his his, uh, for lack of a better term, bloated Elvis period. Okay, of the seventies where he was performing in Las Vegas in the white suits. Yeah, with, yeah, with, yeah, with, yeah, very. Yeah, the, the bloated. He set Elvis the period. standard for Vegas attire. He certainly did. He did. 
Yeah. But Elvis in 68 came back and did the famous TV special, which reintroduced him to a whole new generation of fans. But the problem with that was, is he started to have some hits again. Suspicious Minds, Burning mm -hmm. Love, that sort of thing. But the, 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 the only problem was is that he started playing Vegas. Mm -hmm. And the bloated Elvis period with the suits and he was overweight. Yeah. And he was not the same performer that he once was. Yeah. He was, he was, he probably could have came back and done a more rock and roll show rather than the big splashy Vegas show with yeah. the big band and this backup singers and the whole night and, and the white suits and everything like that. It yeah. would have been accepted a little bit more, but he chose to to go glitzy. play ba Vegas and, and go on, yeah. went out on tour. Do you think his, he chose that or do you think they chose that for him? Did someone direct him and say, hey, I think you've got to make a splash, man. We've got to make you. I think there was a little of both. I think because yeah. Elvis was always very manipulated by his manager, Colonel Tom Parker. Really, Tom Parker called the he called the shots. Really, for, for pretty well throughout Elvis's entire career. Okay, yeah, he was the one that called the shots. And Elvis, one of the big the, one of the big knocks against Elvis is that he never really stood up for himself and really put his foot down and said, "I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to make these." Although he he knew that his career was going in the toilet because he was making all these crappy movies. Yeah. You know, like Kissing Cousins and Fun in Acapulco. And it was basically the same movie in yeah, a different yeah. location. Yeah, yeah. Instead, instead of him playing a surfing instructor in one, he would be playing a lifeguard in the next one and then be playing a race car driver in the next one yeah. with a, a bunch of really, really bad songs that sold well. The soundtrack sold yeah. well. But, <laughs> you know, when you look back on, you know... The Beatles are doing the Beatles are doing you know S Strawberry Fields Forever oh. and Elvis is is re releasing songs like Do the Clam. <laughs> well, he, no, he did. He actually recorded a song Do the Clam. called from one of his movies called Do the Clam. Yeah, well, you know, and it's good advice, I suppose. <laughs> I, yeah, I suppose it is, but you know, from a from a, a credibility standpoint, I hear you. Know, and you've got quality versus quantity. In exactly, this case, right? and yeah. and he Elvis yeah. knew that. These making these movies was doing nothing to enhance his career, but he kept doing them because they made him a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Elvis could have put his foot down with the colonel and said, "Listen, colonel, I can see what's going on around me here. I've still got the chops to to do this kind of stuff, the same sort of stuff that all these other artists are doing in, yeah. in the mid '60s." But he chose to make these bad movies, and by the time he, by the time time he came back. In the late sixties, in the early seventies, unfortunately, it was too late. That's sad. It was too late. It was sad, and then he died in seventy-seven, sitting on the toilet at his home in Graceland. He was what forty-two years old when Jeez. he died. Yeah, forty-three years old. Very when he sad. Died. It was very sad. It was terrible. Were people? Were there people close to him that agreed with that sentiment that he he let? Colonel Tom Parker direct him in everything, and he never put his foot down. Probably, yeah. but you know, but we don't know that for a fact. We don't know assuming. that for a fact. I mean, his so-called yeah. Memphis Mafia, all his all his pals that he grew up with, that he surrounded himself with, were nothing more than a bunch of yes men mm -hmm. who were riding on Elvis's coattails. I mean, they had a good thing going. They were being, they were, yeah. they were, they were hanging out with Elvis. And living the good life, and they didn't want to, uh, you know, they didn't want to kill the golden goose, mm -hmm. as the old saying goes. Yeah. And so they yeah. didn't. Re I'm sure that some of his close friends were saying to him, "Listen, Elvis, this is this is not doing very well for you, you know." Yeah. But uh, you could do better than this. You can you do can better do than this. this. You can yeah. you can be a, a legitimate artist again. You you've got the voice. You've got the look. Yeah. You've got the you've got the 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 chutzpah in the industry. I mean, who wouldn't have wanted to play with Elvis? In 1967, you know, if he would have, could have found the right material to record, gone into the studio, or he could have he could have attracted the the, the top studio musicians, mm -hmm. uh, the top producers. Uh, he probably could have done, and and if he would have had the right material to record, uh, he probably could have done very well. Yeah, but he chose not to, and I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Tom, the Colonel, controlled his career, yeah. and Elvis, for whatever reason. Never put his foot down and never said, I don't want to do this stuff anymore. 
Oh, it's really, it's a shame. It is a shame. It really is, it a, is shame. a shame. Yeah. Because, you know, you look back on Elvis, the king of rock and roll, as he's called, but really he had, when you look back on it, he had a two or three years at the top of making, of, of being a legitimate a legitimate influential performer. I guess the positive thing is at least he had those he two did. or three years. He did. At least. He did. Yeah. But, you know, that whole decade of this 1960s when he could have been doing all this great stuff, he was making bad movies in California, which yeah. is a, a real shame. And real Vegas shame. wasn't. And uh, Vegas was not. <laughs> Vegas was not a good. You look back. And look and, what he did to Vegas now. Everybody dresses like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, it's all flash. Now. You're, you're right. Flash. Elvis impersonators. You never see an Elvis impersonator with the the '50s rock and roll Elvis. No, it's all the do. '70s Vegas Elvis. Yeah, you know, which is yeah. a real shame because by then he was a a shadow of his former self. Yeah, I mean, he and he was record he was re- recording some pretty good stuff. You know, "Burn in Love" was a great song. "Suspicious Minds" was a great song. "Kentucky Minds. Rain" was a great song. Dave, it's been it's it's been phenomenal talking with you. Uh, and I look forward to doing this again. Yeah, I look forward to it as well. It's been fun. You've been listening to the stories behind the songs with Dave Kittle. We'll be back in 2019 with more in-depth conversation about the music of yesterday and today. Brought to you by Sunholes Music. Download the latest album now at sunholes.com.